On today's podcast, I'll be talking with Simon Horrocks. Simon has over 30 years experience in the music industry, beginning as a performing musician and writer in Detroit and touring for eight years nationwide with the Freddie Jones Band. Simon eventually transitioned from artist to manager, working for artists like Sierra and Akon. Simon then co-founded Afix Music, an LA-based music licensing company placing quality independent music with some of today's biggest brands like the Walt Disney Company, HBO, Warner Pictures, EA Sports, and many more. In 2015, Horrocks teamed up with longtime friends Dave Newpert and Dave Trumfio to build Gold Diggers, a unique venue and recording studio complex in East Hollywood. Simon, we got Simon Horrocks with us today. This is going to be a fun conversation. Um, I, I met you about a year ago, and um, we have so much to, to unpack on this episode. But thank you so much for, for joining me today. 100% my pleasure. How are you doing? How you been? What's what's new in your world? Um, everything's great in my world. Just getting ready for the holidays, but uh, Saturday we ended up doing a a big open house at Gold Diggers. Um, we opened up the hotel, we opened up the bar, and all the studios. And you know, it's been a long time since people have been able to see what we've been doing in here because of the pandemic. So we have made a lot of improvements and we just wanted to kind of showcase that stuff. Amazing. Well, you have, gosh, over 30 years of experience in the music industry. You're, you're working on at Gold Diggers uh, now, um, but I want to go back to like the early beginnings um, with you as a musician and, and what, what kind of got you started in this space? Uh, well, music, my dad, you know, it's funny. My family came from England and, uh, my dad got this job working in a music store in Detroit. And, you know, I was kind of gravitated towards the drum kit. And because I was a spoiled little brat, my parents made a deal with me that was if I started taking lessons, then I couldn't quit until I was old enough to make that decision. Um, and so I, I was like, I promise I won't quit. I went to my first lesson. It was like the practice pad. I did 30 minutes of practicing at home. And I was like, I want to quit because it, you know, <laughs> like, like every kid, it doesn't come easy right away. Um, but they, you know, they reminded me that I made them this deal and I'm glad I did because, you know, it's carried me through my whole life. It saved my life in so many different ways. Um, you know, I started taking lessons, private lessons, and it kind of put me ahead of the curve when I would go to school and I studied in school. So, but by the time they started teaching in school, I had already had all the basics. And while I was a horrible student in every other aspect of my academic career, the one thing I could do was play music. So I, I got kind of lucky. That's amazing. Well, actually, in a, in a few episodes ago, I talk. I was uh, talking with this guy Sakaya about how, um, you know, psychologically, when you want to learn a new skill, uh, it's like you get so excited and you think that you, you know, I can do this. I want to do this, uh, and you're like your your confidence levels at like ninety nine percent, and then you try it, and then you realize how bad you are at it because you don't have the information or the skill set yet, whatever, and that confidence just goes way down to like five percent. And a lot of people give up. A lot of people quit. And you saying that it shaped your life now, you know, you had that persistence. If you would have quit, your life might have been a lot different than what it was today. Without a doubt, I'd probably be in jail. And I mean, <laughs> I mean that realistically because I grew up in, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, but I definitely got into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, anytime I got to the point where music, where you know, I was really kind of going off the rails with drugs and alcohol or whatever. I kind of got pulled back in by having some, you know, stuff that I had to do with music. So it really did kind of save my life. It, it's funny, you know, I, I I was the kind of kid that I did when I was playing music. I played I played everything. I played in school band. I played in orchestra. I played in jazz band. I played with rock bands. I played um I played like in the pit orchestra of musicals or whatever, but I would have these lessons every week. And this is, I was so dumb that uh, it would be my lesson. Like every Tuesday, it's five o'clock or something. And I would forget that I had a lesson and not practice or like, you know, work on any of the stuff that I, you know, my homework that I had to do. 
And, you know, what would happen is my mom would be like, okay, well, you got your drum lesson tonight. And I'd be like, oh shit, you know? Uh, and I would sit in the car with the book that I had to, you know, my music and I would literally go through it in my head on my lap. And it ended up being this great skill to have because then all of a sudden I became really good at sight reading music because I could look at it and visualize it and, and interpret it like I was playing it. And then I would walk in the room and I would actually have to play it. And it was just basically out of um, laziness that I ended up developing that skill. Amazing. I love it. Well, tell me about, uh, tell me about the Freddie Jones band. Oh my God. Uh, Freddie, uh, it's funny. Uh, talk about music saving my life i um i was i got signed to a record deal actually i was signed as a producer and a writer by chris chris blackwell i, I was working with this artist young artist named jamie loring she was signed to uh island and i was writing and producing her project with my my partner at the time we had a studio in chicago that we built from the ground up and um that whole deal went sideways, you know, basically it was, I thought I was, I thought we were going to be Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, you know, those, those were kind of my idols, guys that were producers at that time, that whole deal went sideways. We were nowhere near as talented as those guys. <laughs> um, and I woke up one day uh, in my apartment, completely broke going, what the hell am I going to do? And, you know, I just I, I started picking up the phone and calling people and asking folks, hey, you know, one thing I know I can do is I can play drums. So I called a bunch of people that I knew and I called this guy, Will Leonard, um, who had called me a couple of years earlier. He had moved to Chicago from Detroit and I knew him there. And um, and I said, well, you know, when you came to town, you needed some gigs. So I turned you on to some people and gave him all the gigs that I wasn't going to do. I said, you know, I need I need you to return the favor. And he said, well, I'm actually moving back to Detroit and I'm playing in this band that's probably better suited for you than it's suited for me. And so he said, I'm playing this Thursday night at this place called Otis's. Come and sit in in the third set and, you know, we'll see if it makes any sense. And so third set came around and. You know, at that time, the band was doing mostly covers. It was sort of um, in the 90s, real resurgence of the Grateful Dead. The jam band scene had really started to take off. You know, Fish was happening, Blues Traveler, Horde Tour, Almond Brothers. All of that stuff was still really happening. And um, and so that was kind of the material that they were playing. And that band had a real audience and was doing well in kind of bars in, in Chicago and so I came and sat in on the third set and played and and Marty, who was like the acoustic guitar player and one of the singers turned around and was like, this is working. And um, he ended up transitioning out of the band and I walked right into it. So, you know, the cool thing for me was I had um, a bunch of experience and had already had a record deal and studied music business. So I, I kind of brought that experience to that that band who essentially was just, you know, maybe had a cassette and had maybe done a little bit of recording, but was really surviving as a live band. So I suggested we go into a studio. Uh, this guy, Craig Williams had a studio called Dr. Caw and we made our first CD there and, and then kind of just started playing shows all over and selling the CDs off the bandstand. And, um, you know, literally at that time we could go into a town and find a record store. Um, I'd go in, like we play a show in somewhere in Ohio and I'd go and grab the phone book and go into the office of the club that we were playing, call every single record store that was in town to see if they would take our CD on consignment. And a lot of places did. So, you know, we were able to find a following. We ended up selling about 10,000 copies of that CD wow. on our own before we got a record deal. So you were almost in a way acting as the, you know, you you played a, a role in the band musically, but also like a manager in a way for that band. Yeah, I mean, I felt with that band, you know, the band had a bunch of different skill sets. Jim Bonna was this the bass player, was an incredible networker. Uh, Wayne, the guy that was the um, guitar player and one of the 
principal songwriters and kind of one of the driving forces could book a ton of shows. But I kind of brought this other element of the recorded music and sort of the ability to sell records for the band. And um, it just ended up working out really well. I mean, we ended up having a record deal before we had a manager. We had a booking agent. You know, we were networking with other bands. We played some shows with the Samples, um, which was this band out of Colorado that had been signed to A&M. We became friends with the manager. He turned us on to their agent, this guy, Armand Sadler, who was um, out of D.C. And he was the original agent for Fish and all of these bands, um, kind of like their first stepping stone before they ended up having real record deals and kind of going to the big time. And so we sort of followed suit and we ended up having him as our agent and being able to tour um, and finding an audience. You know, fortunately, we were a band that had um, an audience, right? Like there was sort of a movement that was happening with this culture. The dead had come back and there was like this whole burgeoning sort of triple A radio scene. Um, you know, there it was were, a perfect storm. <laughs> it really was. It was. It was good timing for us. So, yeah. That's amazing. Well, I I think now in the space that music's in, I think a lot of young um, artists or creatives or musicians or anything really, I think it's important for them to understand that you do have to have somewhat of a base level understanding of how the business works, how the music industry works before you can expect to see growth or do these things. Like hearing you say, like I would go up and down the phone books and call these, you know, th those are the things that people don't understand. Those are the like small things that that really make a big difference. Um, and I think having that entrepreneur mindset going into something, even if you are a creative and that brain, that part of your brain might not work as good as the other side, you still have to have an understanding of it. Um, I think so. you need to have more than an understanding of it. I think it needs, it's almost a, as much of the job as it is to create the music today. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I, I, we did this event on Saturday and I ended up talking to this band for half an hour on the soundstage stage. They're just young guys that are young and hungry and they really want to get out there and do it. But, um, you know, I I would hate it. I, I became a manager later on and I would kind of I would hate it because you would meet these young artists and they'd say, you know, I just need somebody to take me to the next level kind of thing. And that's really not how it works. I mean, essentially, if you're you know, you've got to have an understanding of how to reach. An, they, they said, what's your one piece of advice? And I said, find an audience, you know, I mean, today there's a lot better tools to do it. We were doing it with phone books and mailing lists. I mean, we would have a mailing list party where we had an artist draw literally all the tour that, you know, the dates of where we were playing. And we finally, we found somebody who had a computer and entered all the mailing lists and had them print the mailing list and then we'd stick the you know the the stamps and the the addresses on the envelopes and literally go and mail them out you know today it's like you know you can put that stuff on instagram or tiktok and somebody finds you yeah. but i mean finding an audience I mean, honestly labels are lazier now than they've ever been right like they're not looking, they're, they're looking for something that's already working so that they can replicate that model. Um, it's a, it's a definitely a different world, but it's yeah. still the same world, you know, it's like <laughs> make great music, find an audience that resonates and then, you know, use the tools that you have to, to get out there. Yeah. And that's the thing too, that a lot of people need to focus on is, is just make great music. You know, if, if you are making great music, then the rest should, should come and it will come, but that's your first step. <laughs> it's true. I had this guy, um, I was talking to a guy who's like a college kid at USC and I don't, I have a music licensing company as well. And, and he said to me, Oh, um, you know, I want to start a music licensing company. And I knew who this kid was a little bit. Uh, and I just said, okay, so why do you want to do it? Do you want to start a music licensing company? Or are you going to start a music licensing company as a way to deliver your music? Because if you're doing this as, as a way to, you know, try and, and get your music out there, then I, I said, don't start a music licensing company, concentrate on making your music. You know, I mean, otherwise you're going to spend the rest of your life building a platform, trying to get that business going. 
And all that time and energy is going to be away from what you really want to do and your love, which is to actually make the music. So my advice for him was slightly different. <laughs> well, it's good advice too, because you want to be honest with people who it's oh, like you said, you're, it's going to take a, a lot of time away from time that could be spent creating. Yeah. So you, if, I knew, if I knew I was going to be staring at spreadsheets as much as I was staring at spreadsheets <laughs> days, I would have taken a slightly different path. Um, <laughs> you know, I would have studied spreadsheets more and maybe not gone this way too. <laughs> exactly. So you transitioned eventually from being an artist to a manager. What Talk about that process and what made you um, kind of go towards being an artist manager. I mean, it was something I was always interested in. Fortunately, when I when it part of my path goes back a little bit further, you know, I was a I was a player. I started out as a player. I played drums. I was able to make a living playing drums. So I played with a lot of different people. And and you know, I was going to music school and I I was I didn't really do well at music school, honestly. I could perform well, but as far as the fundamentals of the music theory and all that stuff and, and you know 7 a.m class um studying like you know uh four-part harmony for me was a difficult it was a hard putt especially because i was playing clubs at the time too so um i didn't do too well at that but after a couple of years of being in college i found a program in chicago that was a music business program and so I started studying the business of music. And from there, I was like, okay, I need to, instead of just being a music, if I was going to be in the music business, I had to understand how the business actually worked. You know, I had a buddy of mine say, music is a small word. Business is a big word. Learn the business, you know? And, uh, and so I did, I, I, I was always fascinated by it. I wanted to know how it worked and, that taught me immediately that I needed to write material um, really if I was going to have a career. So it taught me the difference of what a writer was, what a publisher was, what an artist was, what a musician was, you know, all of the different, you know, disciplines that exist in this industry. Um, and, you know, being an entrepreneur, I ended up doing them all, but uh, you know, I was doing management for, a long time from inside my band, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. But um, I had a guy that managed the Freddie Jones band, uh, Charlie Brusco, and he was our manager. And and uh, we we got him after we got our record deal and we had him as our manager for about three or four years. And um, we fired him and we made some changes in the in the band for different reasons or whatever. But couple of years after he and I maintained a relationship. Um, and uh, after a few years, probably around 1999, he ended up calling me at the top of the year. He was, you know, he was one of these old school managers that had a call list of people that he would call. And I think it was like January 4th, which was the Monday back after, you know, the new year's. And he just called me and he, he was like, look, man, you know, I've been watching what you're doing at that time. We were without a manager in the band. And so I was kind of handling that stuff by default. And uh, and he said to me, do you want to, how about you come work for me and be a manager? And I thought to myself, wow, this could be an interesting opportunity. So I was married at the time, had one kid, had another one on the way. And I was like, man, this seems like the perfect point to not be living on a tour bus and kind of make that leap to the next level. And see if I could do what I was doing for myself for other people. And, you know, he had a couple of bands that he was working with. His specialty was he had a bunch of classic rock bands. He had Styx, he had Bad Company, he had um, Leonard Skinner. And he had at that time what we were, we would joke and say were dinosaur bands, right? Like, <laughs> you know, these old school rock bands that nobody really cared about what their new albums were. Um, they really just wanted to go see him live. And he he was kind of a pioneer of taking a band that had a brand name and essentially they would put out a new album to support their touring schedule. And all those bands are incredibly successful, but not sure anybody wanted to hear a brand new Skinner song. You know, they wanted to hear Freebird and, you know, Simple Man and all the hits, right? So um, 
he had a bunch of younger bands that he was working with and wasn't able to service them very well. So that's why I came into the picture and I started working for him then. But that was, you know, right at the beginning of Napster, which really had a massive effect on like a young band's ability to go get a record deal at that time. Like my model at that time was I could find some young bands um, you know, go out and try and get a record deal for them. You know, if I could create a bidding war for them, you know, we could get, you know, anywhere from 250 to a million dollars in a, in a, in an advance for the first record. And then we could go make a go of it and see if we could actually turn that into a career. Um, but, you know, with the advent of uh, Napster and records not selling the way they were, the business was undergoing a massive change in the early 2000s, which really, really affected my ability to kind of make money in that way. So I had a couple other bands I was working with. I actually, I was managing Survivor at that time. He gave me that band. Oh, wow. Ethan. <laughs> Um, I had a lot of challenges with that band on the live front, but um, that kind of taught me about licensing music. Eye of the Tiger was a massive hit and had this film association from the Rocky movie. And, um, you know, that that song had an incredible life of its own beyond the band. And we were able to, you know, I was able to license a lot of that uh, for a lot of film, a lot of television. I mean, we're doing pretty tremendous business with that. So that kind of got me into that world as well. Well, it sounds like you're also, you know, you were staying curious about other, you know, ways that you can kind of learn and grow in that business. Like you weren't limiting yourself to just being an artist or just being a manager. Like when you saw opportunities, you, you know, you capitalize on them. And, and also it's like a great learning experience. So for you venturing into music licensing, like what are some big things that you learned at that time where you're like, oh shit, there's, you know, either a lot of money in this or there's, you know, like what were some of those key learnings for you at that time? So one of the funny things was that we ended up, <laughs> this is a funny story. We ended up, we, um, there was an opportunity that kind of popped up for Eye of the Tiger. Um, there was a Nissan truck commercial and, uh, and so the director had sold the concept of the commercial through to the advertising agency. They had shot the entire commercial, which was, you know, millions of dollars in budgets. And they had bought all the advertising time and were ready to launch it. But they nobody it had somehow slipped through the cracks that nobody actually licensed the song. And it was one of those, oh, shit moments, like we're in a bad spot. So they came to us with an initial offer. And I knew it was actually this leverage point for us as a band that you, you know, for an artist that you rarely find yourself in, which was I was able to say no enough times that, you know, they had such a financial commitment to already baked into this project that they couldn't abandon it. And so that we could crank up the value of of what we got out of it and one of the things that we did in it was we forced them to use a re-record of the master so for people that don't know every piece of recorded music has two copyrights it has the song which is music and lyrics and then the the other aspect is the actual physical embodiment of the recording of that. So typically when you have a record deal and this is, this all comes from my knowledge of the business, right. And studying the business. And so we controlled the song, um, but we, you know, the, the master was owned by BMG at that time. It was originally, they were signed to this label called Scotty Boy, and then that had sold. And so it ended up in a major. Um, and typically what happens is if you get $100,000 for the song, there's another $100,000 for the master. So it's $200,000 total. So, but that $100,000 for the, the master goes to the record company. And then the artist will get half of that money in time at some point. Um, but based off of how much money they actually owe. So if they had an unrecouped advance of, you know, a million dollars, that the $50,000 that they would have gotten from that placement 
goes back to the label and takes that $50,000 off their balance sheet. So I was able to say, well, if you're going to use the song, then you're going to use our master, which meant that the, 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 my guys would get all the money. And, uh, and so it was such a crazy situation that I had notified the guys in the band that this was an idea and I went back into the office and all this stuff was happening early in the morning. And, and I ended up, uh, we didn't actually have a, a recording of the song. And so I, I called the guys in the band. I was like, you know what? I think we can do this and we can kind of force them to use our master. And, um, you know, so I called this, this studio that I knew in Chicago and I was in living in Atlanta at this time. I called this place CRC. I knew the studio manager, Hank Newberg. I'm like a studio five available today, which was the big room there. And he's like, it is. I'm like, cool. Book it at 1 PM. I got, and I go and tell your engineer to go get a copy of Eye of the Tiger, go to the CD store and buy it, throw it into Pro Tools, and we're going to match it up. And <laughs> I literally jumped on a plane and flew to Chicago, and I ended up playing drums on that. Like, you know, it was really just the beginning of it. So it was like the... Oh, yeah. Like, we just matched what was on the record, and we were able to force the the advertising agency to use our <laughs> so you know that's it was amazing kind of, it was kind of a lucky deal you know i mean it was like all the shit lined up for that to happen but quite frankly it was like man if i didn't have the understanding of the business or so here's the other thing is like a, a an artist is in a record deal and this is this is you know people will know this in a more modern sense from the taylor swift stuff right is that her record company got sold and they ended up like you know she ended up re-recording all of her songs but in a typical recording agreement there's a seven year probably re-record restriction that means that if you make an album for a record company you can't go back and make a, another version of that stuff for yourself as the artist until you're out of that agreement for seven years. And with Survivor, they were way out of the deal by that point, and they had not done a re-record of it. Um, subsequently, they had done like a real re-record with the band and the singer and all that stuff so that they can control that master. But I'm, um, uh, you know, I mean, I knew the business and I was able to, you know, and fortunately I had the leverage in order to get that done at that time. I mean, you know, that, that was a kind of a rare circumstance, but you know, I turned, I turned that into a pretty good opportunity for my artists. Yeah. I mean, that's what any artist wants too, is to be able to surround themselves with people who can get shit done for them and, and, you know, put themselves in positions. That's pretty impressive to be able to, you know, Go last minute, book a studio, re-record a master, and there you go. Somebody at Nissan's getting fired. <laughs> you know, it was the advertising agency. Yeah, I mean, somebody, somebody, I, you know, I just took advantage of an opportunity. I mean, I love know, it. Those windows tend to close over time. They're like, not going to do that again. You know, yep. so, yeah, like you said, that guy, somebody probably got fired <laughs> over that one. No, I love that though. That's that's amazing. And and also, you know, the cool thing too, I'm sure that you know, obviously, you you've known this world for a long time now but music licensing also can you know protect the artist and and if it's important you know if your music is being used anywhere even for young artists and creatives in general i mean that's something that even photographers put in their contracts you know hey if i do a photo shoot for a magazine that's one price but if you end up putting that on a big giant billboard that's a whole nother discussion so i think it's cool to to know or maybe learn more about that side of the business where you're protecting your own assets you're protecting yourself and um you know you're not letting any money you know stay get off the table with everything so <laughs> yeah i mean that's 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 true owning your intellectual property and understanding what rights that you're actually granting somebody because and that goes back to copyright law and there's a lot of le legacy stuff in the copyright law and there's a lot of things that have have been changed because technology changes right like you know the but the ability to make copies of something and grant the use of it is inherently the right of the person who owns it so people 
sometimes even mistakenly say, oh, I've copywritten this, like copywritten it. And it's like, no, it's copyrights as in you have the right to do this or not do it because, you know, the owners collectively can say what can and can't be done with their property. I mean, it's the reason that that stuff is is actually called intellectual property, which is, you know, it is property. Like here at Gold Diggers, we we own the trademark Gold Diggers Sound, and we fought for that. I mean, Gold Diggers was originally the background dancers for uh, Dean Martin. And so they own the trademark, but gold digger sound was something that we could get the trademark for. And we turned that into an opportunity because Leon Bridges recorded his album here and then wanted to use the name, our name gold digger sound for the name of his album. So we ended up licensing the name of our studio to Leon to be used for the name of his album and all of his merchandise, which is, you know, and that was basically found money for us, you know, yeah. just out of being able to capitalize on, on that from our end. Yeah. It's a world that I've tried to learn a lot about too, even with still human and, you know, the business that I'm building now. Um, one of the first thoughts that popped into my head is I got to get this trademarked, you know, I got to get this, this name trademarked and um, you know, I went on there and it ended up, it's a quick little still human story here, but I went on uh, about two years ago onto the trademark office. They have their search thing and a guy owned it and, you know, didn't expire for a while. And I was like, this is going to suck. You know, I'm obviously going to be doing business under this name and it's a similar kind of deal and all that. Long story short, won't get too into it, but he ended up forgetting to renew um, the trademark, which apparently, you know, happens a lot but also they they're pretty good about reaching out to people and i swooped i swooped in there and took that shit so <laughs> yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of things for a, the trademark law is really really a very very serious and deep topic um yeah. and uh it's a lot different than copyright law um mm -hmm. there's how you're using the mark right because my band survivor own the trademark survivor but mm -hmm. there was a television show called survivor that was still in the entertainment space but it was in the television space so there's there's different uses and there's different ability to protect certain certain areas and yeah man if 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 somebody lapses in the use of a of a mark in a in a in a marketplace you know, there is an opportunity for you to get in there, especially if you're using, but you know, you're actually using it, right? Like it's right. not, it's not something you can just sit on and kind of hoard that stuff like a URL, right? Like it's totally it's a little different. <laughs> you got to be actively using it. <laughs> got to be actively using it. Yeah, totally. Well, I want to, uh, you know, talk about Atlanta too, and your time there, what led you to Atlanta? You also, uh, if I'm, you know, correct here, uh, you started your own licensing agent agency as well a fix yeah. music is that correct yeah a fix yeah okay a fix okay cool talk about that and your time in atlanta atlanta's amazing by the way i've only spent time there once but it's it's a really cool city it's it's fun talk about your time there yeah so i got there because i was i became a manager and you know my time ended with uh charlie brosco and i had found this artist called uh howard tate who was um like an old school R and B artist that had a song uh, that did okay back in the sixties. And um, I started representing him, which led me to a business manager there who represented a bunch of, you know, hip hop and R and B that was happening. I mean, I grew up loving pop music, black music, whatever, you know, hip hop, R and B, that music really spoke to me. Um, you know, I'm a drummer, so I'm a rhythmic guy. I love that stuff. Um, and, you know, I started working with uh, Sierra. Uh, my The business manager, Robert Polay, was representing her. And, you know, she needed some help. She, you know, her record, her first record was actually done. Um, and she needed some help on the road. So I came on and helped her, uh, like, road managing. She was she was managed by this guy, Nooney who, um, who, you know, and Jazzy Faye had produced a record and, you know, I knew a little bit about being on the road and, and from my experience as a musician. So I started to come in and bring my, 
my lessons to that that camp and um from there i got turned on to this guy divine stevens who we have a shared like a little bit of a shared connection because steve rivkin actually yep. worked with divine and on the akon project so they worked together on akon but divine was kind of this creative guy that could position artists in the marketplace he was sort of a genius at the at that he did that at laface records um he worked with usher um he worked with sierra he worked with tlc he worked with everybody um he worked with puffy um and he had signed akon and so i was i got brought in by him because of my work with sierra when akon had made a like essentially what had happened is uh, convict rec or well, it wasn't convict it was upfront records had a deal with src which is steve rivkin's company and they brought me in to be part of that so i was working with a bunch of these young artists there so we had candy from escape was signed there we had this group called fa that was these rappers a band called red dirt so and we were doing akon's record so akon was a flagship artist we had all these other artists that we were working with and, you know, I was working in the studio with these folks, um, booking time, going in there, recording a ton of music and uh, Red Dirt specifically. I mean, we must have recorded, a, you know, a hundred songs with that group. All of them were with different beats. All of them were different writers. You know, we had a we had a studio and they would just have people coming in, working on records. Every collaboration was different. Um, and, and, you know, at that time it was like, you know, there may be the budget would open up and, and then they would actually put, you know, 12 to 16 songs on a CD. So, but here's a hundred records that haven't found a home or whatever, and are living on a hard drive. And at that time it was, you know, you know, the rock industry had kind of been devastated by the Napster stuff, but the R&B and hip hop community hadn't. And there was a lot of physical products still being sold. And I I thought that what was going to happen there was the same thing that happened in the rock world. So, you know, I started thinking to myself, there's got to be a publishing opportunity here. There's another way to make money with all the all of this music that is not getting monetized at all with the destruction of like sort of the business to consumer model, I thought, man, maybe there's a business to business model. And at the time, my girlfriend was working at this uh, advertising agency and they owned the foot or they, they had the foot locker as a client. And so I got set up in this meeting with the guys from the foot locker because they ended up having another one of their locations had access to a bunch of great sneakers and stuff. And that 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 particular outlet of that particular store was out outselling every other market out like they were just killing everybody and they were getting exclusive stuff. And so they thought, wow, we're going to start maybe another business outside of the Foot Locker. Right. It's like they're a franchise based business. They've got footlocker all over the world maybe we can start this other thing that is essentially lifestyle style gear you know keep footlocker sort of like performance based that's where you go get your running shoes and your tennis shoes but then you go get your gear at this other spot and so i went into this meeting and one of the owners goes right hip-hop is global and or he goes hip-hop is glow or urban is pop and it's global is what he said to me and my mind was blown with that. He just said, hip hop is pop and it's global. And I was like, oh shit, he's right. And um, then we started to talk about the, the, the prospects of this new sort of franchise business. And I brought Divine in to kind of, I figured if he could position artists in the marketplace, he could, he could do the same thing for a corporate entity, right? Um, he knew the market well enough and could really help position them. And kind of as an aside at the end of the meeting, he was like, oh, by the way, we've shot these. We're getting ready to shoot these commercials. Do you know anybody for this basketball spot? Meaning, you know, I translated that. Do you know any black people really? basically? <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, <laughs> we're like, yeah, we can help you out with the talent, you know. So yeah. we they shot this commercial and we had we we delivered the talent. And then once we took a look at the spot, um, you know, we said, send us a copy of it. And everybody, we were watching the spot. It's like, first of all, you don't know anything about basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, you're like, this guy's running right by you. You need to learn how to edit sports, number one. And the music sucks. It was some like library music that was supposed to be hip hop. It was garbage. And so <laughs> I literally sat with my laptop. I had a um, QuickTime file and I put in a beat CD from this producer I was working with, Ku Dollar. And I like I would hit play on the on the QuickTime file and hit play on the CD. And I was like, nope, that one doesn't work. Next one. Nope, that one doesn't work. Oh, shit, that works. And so I ripped it and I emailed them the MP3 of it. And uh, and it ended up getting placed in the commercial. And I got like a couple thousand bucks for it. And so I got the check and I came to Koo and I was like, here's a couple thousand bucks. And he goes, whoa, man, you sold my beat. And I was like, no, I licensed. <laughs> beat. And he goes, what does that mean? And I go, that means that you still own the beat and you get that check. And he just looked at the check and he goes, can we do this again? And I was like, shit, there's a business here. So light, light bulb. <laughs> it was really it was like that, man. I was, I'm so you know, that's exactly what I did is and and then the next thing that came up was I ended up there was a there was a really horrible um reality show called Tear Shears and Beauty, which was like this BET road to the brawn or like I mean it was like an early days reality show on BET. And I know the I knew the producer of it and he needed some music. And so I helped him get the music on it. But at that point the issue was I didn't own the show. And I didn't own the music. So it was like this ping pong ball going back and forth. And I was like, man, like, I can't speak on behalf of either of these parties. I'm just facilitating this. So I need to get myself into a position where I can represent one side or the other and negotiate it. So I ended up like figuring out a way with my business partner, Michael Weeman at the time who worked at BMI and had studied to be, he, he went to, you know, he went to law school. He didn't become an attorney, but you know, it's like, I'm, uh, you know, but he stayed at the holiday Inn express kind of thing, you know? Um, so he, he and I figured out a way to actually clear music and make it available. And we solved a lot of problems for, for music supervisors because, Quite frankly, it was it was a pain point for music supervisors because hip hop is a very complex way of like hip hop and pop music. I mean, you look at a Beyonce record and there's, you know, there's a gang of writers, there's a gang of publishers. There may be a sample in there. There's a lot of there could be a potential lot of landmines or just a lot of work to get that stuff done. So I my when I started to fix, it was like, we can solve creative and legal problems for music supervisors by essentially doing all the heavy lifting in advance and clearing the music and making it available for them. And then on the other side of the equation, it was a way to um, get folks some money. If they were in the studio, they were creating music anyway, you know, and they hadn't done a deal to, like have that placed on a record or hadn't done a deal with a publishing company, then we could, we can, you know, help give them exposure and make revenue from it. So that was kind of, that was kind of how that whole business model came together. And at the time people told me I was crazy. They didn't think I was going to get any artists to sign any deals. And I was like, okay, well, how do we structure a deal that's fair that doesn't handcuff somebody into some bad deal. You know, it's like typically that business was a suffer till you succeed model. It was like you worked under somebody until you had a hit. And then at that point you had some leverage and could renegotiate. So I kind of came up with a way that that wasn't the case. You know, the people got treated fairly and they got paid for their, their work. And the industry needs people like you too, who want to, you know, reform these maybe practices that are old or outdated and, and find ways to protect the artists and bring revenue to the artists. Um, you know, obviously now 2022, we see a lot of that too. Um, but it's interesting, you know, there's actually a, um, 
a guy, he's the president of radio, which is Issa Rae's uh, label. Uh, he'll actually be on the podcast on Wednesday. Um, and he, the way that his company is structured is um, half of it is a label through Atlantic. They have, I think, six or seven artists signed uh, with a deal through Atlantic. And the other half is music supervision for like HBO and mm -hmm. other major, you know, streaming networks and, and companies or, or um, stuff like that. And um, they use a lot of their own artists in house with their deal through Atlantic to, you know, use that for their music supervision uh, side of the business and plug it into, you know, like Issa Rae's uh, Insecure show. She used all of her artists that were signed to her label and, you know, funneled it into that show. So it's cool to see, you know, people that are discovering new ways to kind of plug their own artists or music uh, in, in ways like that. And it's a great way for artists to get broken and to find an audience and to actually make some revenue so that they can keep doing what they're doing. You know, that vertical integration, here's somebody who has that kind of leverage and has the foresight to say, okay, we're going to go ahead and, and, you know, build that into the content. Um, we've actually worked a bunch with that company. They do, they've come here and done some writing camps for different shows that they were involved in where they brought different artists and producers and, um yeah i'm i'm a big fan of that group of people for sure i love having them here yeah they're awesome i i've actually you know worked quite a bit with their roster of artists doing docuseries content and it's just cool. like the the um the work culture that they've kind of built and created i think is is refreshing in the music space um you know sometimes obviously people are trying to make money and 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 do those things but like also when you have the other side of that which is working with great people, people that are passionate about the industry, that care about the music, that care about the artists. Um, it's just, it's really great to have friends like that or people like that, that at the end of the day, aren't dicks, right? Or you, I'm yeah. sure you've worked with a lot of people who you're like, oh, chill out, man. Like this is supposed to be fun. <laughs> Dude, at the end of the day, this business is based on relationships. And I'm, I'm like, to me, that's the most valuable thing. Um, and I'm sure you'll find that as a common thread. And, you know, I mean, short term deals are just that they're short term. I mean, they, you know, they're lopsided. Maybe they work for a minute, but they ultimately they don't they don't carry on for much longer. And one of the parties ends up getting upset about something and they end up, you know, they end up going away. So, you know, I personally don't like to do my business that way. I mean, I started this place with two guys that I met. One guy I met when I was you know, 19 years old. And I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not 19 anymore, but, uh, you know, you look uh, 19. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In my mind, I'm 19, bro. And I look in the mirror and I'm like, what the, what, how did that happen? But, uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, they're, they're people that I've been in bit like, you know, we were friends for years and years. It's funny, man. Cause you know, there's a whole thing. I was, oh, don't, don't go into business with your friends. I'm like, man, maybe you need some new friends. <laughs> yeah, I love, that's so true. It's so true because it's like, well, it seems to me like your friends aren't very trustworthy. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, maybe. Well, we, yeah. yeah, what one of my favorite quotes too that I've always tried to to kind of live by too is, um, play long term games with long term people. Absolutely. And, you know, when you, when you have people that you can trust in your inner circle and you're having fun and you're doing things for the love of it, but also you're obviously trying to make money and, and grow a business and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, life's not supposed to be that hard, obviously in the journey of life, you're going to, you're going to fail and, and you're going to, you know, go through certain transitions and self-discovery and all that. But at the end of the day, you know, it should be fun. It should be towards a common goal of just like discovering yourself, having a good time. And um, I think that's one of the great things too about you and and the the life that you've built is um, every time that I've spent with you, it's, it's always been fun. You know, we're just here for fun and. Yeah. yeah. And try to connect the dots and make stuff happen. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm a curious dude, you know, I'm, you said it earlier. I mean, I love when you said that uh, I just, I have a curiosity for stuff and it's, I'm, I hopefully I'll never lose that you know, but it's led me to a lot of different things in the business. And, um, I'm, I'm fortunate that way. Totally. Well, I want to touch up on, uh, gold diggers. Um, you know, you've kind of, what we've talked about so far has led up to this moment in 2015, where you mentioned you started gold diggers with two of your friends. Um, and a lot has come out of that. I mean, you guys have a beautiful studio. There's a hotel there. There's a bar that you guys do 
live shows and events weekly, um, you know, kind of talk about what sparked that idea and, and everything leading up to now. Um, you know, I was in Atlanta. I, I had split with my business partner at a fix. He essentially decided that he wanted, you know, he was starting a family and he'd wanted to go a different way. Um, I was in a relationship that was ending there. Uh, and I had always wanted to move to LA and live in LA and I had never done it. Um, and so I had an opportunity and I just kind of picked up and came here and within the first 15 days of me being here I was networking and being with you know people that I knew and connecting the dots and letting them know that I was going to be moving here and living here and I went over to my it was funny I have a picture of my buddy Dave Dave Newport with his daughter because she was sick and home from school so I got to meet her that day and I <laughs> took a picture of him and it was October 1st and uh when I sat with him I said you know look man we've been friends a long time um, you know, and he's an entrepreneur. And I said, if there was anything for us to do together, you know, I'd be welcome to that. I'm going to be here now. I've got my licensing business, but you know, if the opportunity presents itself, I'm down. And he was like, okay, well, I'm looking at this place. That is this property. That's an old hotel. That's been vacant. It's a strip club. And then behind it, there's this crazy old soundstage. That's a rehearsal space that's kind of fallen on some hard times. And he's like, I'm thinking of working with these guys over at bedrock and maybe put a rehearsal space. He's like, I don't know. Maybe it'll be editing suites. Maybe it'll be creative office space. It's just kind of the kicker to the property. And it's like, I don't know. So it, I was like, okay, cool. And I just kind of put that in the back of my mind. And then like, a couple of days later, I met with another friend of mine who happens to be named Dave as well. They're both named Dave. <laughs> they both, Dave and Dave. They they both lived on the same hill in Silver Lake. They're both from Chicago and had never met. And it ended up turning out that uh, the second Dave that I met with, Dave Trumpio, his little brother had hung out with Dave Newport's little sister and they went to school together. So there's like this whole the matrix like, uh, broke. <laughs> Totally. But I went out to lunch with Dave Trumpio. We were over at mess hall in, uh, in Los Feliz. And I was like, what are you doing, man? And, and he and I had done our first record together when we were like 20, I was 20 and he was like, you know, I think 18 maybe at the time. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, I've kind of developed this business where, I, I get into these buildings and then I build recording studios in, in them and I rent them out to producers and composers and, you know, different musicians that need a home base. And I was like, wow, that's kind of a cool concept. You know, it's like, how's business? And he's like, well, I got MGMT. I got Butch Vig in one room. I got this film composer. He's like, I was like, is it doing well? He's like, I'm book solid, man. And I was like, do you ever need hotel rooms? And he's like, man, we always have artists coming in from out of town. So we need hotel rooms. I was like, are you interested in expanding? And he's like, absolutely. <laughs> and I was like, I think I have something for us. And so I literally set up a meeting between the two guys and, and we sat down at lunch and it was one of those things where it was like within f about 30 minutes, we said, I mean, it was literally like, oh, you know, this person, you know, that person, how's this, how's that, da, 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 da. fuck it, let's do it. And so that's kind of how it was born originally was that we were going to take this old bow trust, 5,000 square foot bow trust ceiling, you know, space in the back and turn it into uh, recording studios that we weren't going to equip and that we were just going to rent out to other artists um, and let them have this space. But as time went on, we thought, well, maybe we'll take a couple of them and outfit those and rent those and then rent the other ones long term. And that started out and then it became more renting of the studios. And then there were two people in here. We had Sam Hollander, who's a big songwriter. We had Brent Kutzel, who was in One Republic. He had a room in here. And then those guys ultimately left. So we ended up taking over the whole building ourselves and, and turning it into gold diggers. I mean, fortunately, 
we opened up the space in 2019 and there was, you know, between all of the connections that we had and the business that Dave had with his, his recording studios on the East side and all the music business connections, we just had one big party in December of 2018 and like the beginning of 2019, we were like, literally I was standing in, in my office with Dave Trumpio and he just looks at me and goes, well, build it and they will come. That's the saying. Right. And we were like, oh, well, I hope they come. And, you know, they did, they, <laughs> they did, man. You know, I mean, fortunately people thought we were insane. They're like, why are you creating a commercial studio? And we're like, we're not, we're creating seven commercial studios. <laughs> And people thought we were fucking insane, dude. Um, Isn't that ironic that every time someone thinks you're insane, you're actually doing something genius? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's genius, but I mean, it's a, it it was like it was an opportunity that you right. know. I mean, I I didn't think it would be as successful as it is. You know, um, I mean, we've doing so many records, probably 120 records a month or 120 sessions a month. I mean, I've just built two Atmos rooms, um, which is this new format. Well, it's not even new, but I mean, last year, Apple said that they were committing to spatial audio. And that was this, this huge sea change. in like last week, uh, Tesla said that they were releasing the software to a million cars. Um, like, you know, Amazon delivers their music in the format. It, it's, you know whether it's Sonos, whether it's Vizio, whether it's Mercedes, Volvo, Apple. I mean, there's a, you know, millions of devices that have this stuff that are standard to the headphones. I mean, it's this, in, it's an incredible format and the distribution is there. It's just now we need a bunch more content. Well, I want to touch on that really quick. I'm actually going to share my screen because um, I want to show some pictures of the, the actual room where you record this. It's it's something super interesting. You actually gave me the chance to come by a few months ago and listen to some some tracks that were recorded uh, in Dolby Atmos. And it was it was incredible. It was one of the coolest things I've experienced hearing like the snare in the top left of the corner and hearing the voice in the back right and the shifts and the sounds. It's It's definitely something that you know, I, I hope all people can experience whether it's in your, you know, I know Apple's coming out with a lot of products that, you know, uh, support that like the AirPods and, and things like that. But you guys actually have uh, a physical studio. So I'm going to share my screen Yeah, really quick. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, we've kind of gone down this path in the music industry before with quad and then with five one, and it didn't really, you know, it was a little bit of a, um, like, eh, you know, Oh, there's our merchandise. That's Studio One right there. Perfect. Yeah. So here's uh I think this page shows all your your studios here in the bottom left. Yeah. Yeah. Your the, the studios are are beautiful. I love the, you know, the wood look and it's just like got this very warm kind of vibe to it. We um, call it shipping crate chic. <laughs> I love that. That's a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's studio two that's where i am right now that's a neve that's a 1974 neve that we bought from during the pandemic from robert DeLeo and stone temple pilots he came here to do they they did uh they did a live stream of the purple album on the sound stage and uh we got to be friends and he was downsizing his studio and he was like wow your place is really cool like are you guys interested in some gear and i was like maybe <laughs> and we went down to his place in palos verdes and it was like holy shit you have the best of the best of the best so this thing is pristine man i mean it's it's from 1974 but it is it's like it came out of you know oxford england like yesterday it's just pristine and looks brand new fresh out of the box <laughs> yeah man i mean you wouldn't think that that thing's uh almost as old as me <laughs> well it's so cool that also in the, in the world of music that a lot of artists too want to use these older products that are almost timeless in a way because um yeah it's just like a lot even like for example, someone that plays a synth wants a synth from the 80s or whatever, to either to emulate a sound or just to achieve something that was built so great at that time. Um, so it's cool to walk into your studios and see all this great equipment, um, new and old. 
part of what we tried to do is have the best of both worlds. So, you know, we've got, you know, state of the art computer systems and the latest technology um, paired together with sort of the greatest hits of the audio world. I mean, the way, the reason why this board that I'm sitting in front of is so there's that's, this that's, is the one. <laughs> yeah. So the, he, this was state of the art, 1974, that state of the art, uh, 2023 right there um this is incredible yeah so that room right there is studio six that's kind of our flagship when we have three different formats that we're we mix in in that room we've got regular stereo we just did a new show for netflix a television series and and ed our our chief engineer just mixed the soundtrack for that then it also supports um what what was our first uh foray into uh spatial audio and immersive sound was uh sony's 360 so they have a they have a specific format that they that they've got and then the latest is the atmos stuff so that room uh supports atmos in a 9.1.4 scenario so there's nine speakers surrounding you the one is the subwoofer and then there's four speakers above your head that give you the, you know, this ability to have music around you. And, you know, a lot of the previous forays into sort of, you know, multi-channel formats were pretty gimmicky um, and not necessarily completely well thought out. This stuff is, is fully formed. Um, the big difference is that it's this thing, it's object-based and not channel-based. So if you had a 5-1 system, it would be that you would tell, like you said, the snare drum to be over here on the left side or, you know, and then the bass would be on the right side. Like when you listen to the old Beatles records and you hear, oh, the drums are on the left side and the voice is on the right side, they're in different channels. The way that the objects work are that if you've got a 914 system or you've got a 714 system or you've got a 51 or you've got a stereo, pair of stereo headphones the objects fold down and automatically go up based off of what your listening environment is so the technology is incredible and it comes standard when you buy an apple tv and it's playing back through there so what i played for you was some Billie Eilish, um, like a couple other different artists. And those are all just streaming back uh, in spatial audio from Apple Music directly. So Apple supports it, Tidal supports it, Amazon supports it. And then, you know, all of the, all of the television, uh, you know, app, um, you know, Netflix, Amazon, they all support it too. So it's out there, man. And, and, you know, this studio is designed so that when people can, you know, when they want to mix their material in this format, which is becoming essentially like an essential deliverable that you have to do if you're turning in an album now, you have to support this format. Um, you know, you've got the ability to come here and cut it and then mix it as well. It's amazing. It's such a cool development in the in the space of music too and, and even just audio in general I, my spatial airpods too i'll be on a walk and i'll hear a car go, coming and i'll look to the right <laughs> and the music will like change to the left it'll move to the left ear as if it's like a spatial thing and i always forget i'm like that's so funny that this is like <laughs> and it's, it's getting been- better all the time i mean they're constantly releasing software and new hardware um for it this is a this is studio nine it's a smaller version of the same sort of setup this room doesn't have the the dolby system in here so this is a true 914 setup in there but that room sounds incredible we had dolby come in here and tune it we made a deal with pmc which is a speaker manufacturer and um you know we we put this if you notice on there the screen that has pro tools is down below so it doesn't obstruct the speakers um, in front of you so there's nothing in the speakers and then the one above that's the dolby renderer that actually shows you where each one of the objects is going to be placed in the room it's a trip man it's really cool 
I have one quick technical question too for this yeah. this Dolby um program right here that's running on the the main TV. Do you plug in stems to each object through there? Is that how it works? And then you can mix down from there. Program? Yeah. So there are a couple of different ways. So you can actually, if you were working from Pro Tools, there's plugins for Dolby, and then the renderer also, which is a separate program running on a separate computer. Um, and then you can either take stems or any of the individual tracks and then place them in the room. There's a couple of different ways that you can do it. There's a thing called the bed track, which is, which has a bed where there's a bunch of objects based in. And then there's as many as 128 different objects that can be placed around the room. So some people get gimmicky with it. Um, and But I have to tell you, some, some things are incredibly musical, like you know, Bruce Botnick, who is the guy who actually recorded all the Doors records, has been mixing in this format. He's still incredibly active and still has great ears. And he actually has just redone all the Doors music in Atmos. And it's kick ass, man, because it's, you know, the guy who was in the room when they were recording it mixed it. So it sounds like you're in the room with the band, you know. And then like the talking heads catalog just got released in it. And I didn't realize, you know, part of it is that it's not just like shit's just flying at you from everywhere. Part of it is, you know, now you've got space to put it. Whereas you were trying to cram an entire band into two speakers. Now you can, you know, you can just kind of have this wider canvas to paint with, man. And it's, it's pretty special. It's a different world for sure. It, it's got to be great too for the, you know, for the engineers who, like you mentioned, you know, back in the Beatles, it's so clear that you can tell that they only had two channels to work with. Uh, everything was stereo and and it's like voice, drums, guitar comes in here. Sometimes it's like super way left or super way right. But with this spatial audio, things are just put so nicely and neat in their space that you can, it's, yeah, it's like this three-dimensional audio. It really is. It's like 3D audio. And it's funny you mentioned the Beatles because- you know, they were one of the first groups that they when the you know, and this is something that we draw this analogy all the time. If you think about it, man, back then, everything was in mono. There was literally one speaker and people thought that stereo was a fad. So they like when they just released Revolver, they they released the original mono recordings. And then they're like, oh, here's our experimental stereo mix. And now they're they're going back in and remixing that stuff. They've got the technology to tear apart all of the music and put it into spatial audio. So like literally we were listening to Taxman this morning um, from Revolver in spatial audio in this new format. And it sounds incredible. Wow. Just it's a totally it. different experience. And it might also have the ability to bring out sounds that might have been buried in the old platform or in the old formats dude they just released thriller um on in spatial audio and i've listened to that album a million times and it may be one of the greatest recorded albums ever because of you know michael jackson bruce swedeen who is the engineer and the production of quincy jones and it has the greatest studio musicians on it I heard shit in those mixes that I have never heard before in my life. I was like, where, where was that? That was there <laughs> this whole time. And it just kind of just flew by because it was crammed into, you know, you're listening to it in your car or whatever. And yes, you're getting the essence of, wow, Michael is an incredible vocalist, but holy shit, that's on that stuff. I mean, I was listening to Billy Jean and it blew my mind. Like, like it did the first time when I heard it, you know? Would you consider this almost, and it, this might be a reach, so correct me if I'm wrong, but would this be the similar way as to when TVs were, or visuals were black and white, and then they transitioned into color? I really think it's that that big of a sea change, man, honestly. And obviously, Apple did too, because they went all in last year, and it really just kicked down the door for this stuff. And I, I think as 
as it gets better and better, like as the as the headphones get better and better, more people are going to experience it. Right. Because the first thing is, is like, oh, well, I got to have a special rig to do this. It's like, not really, man. If you're buying a sound bar, the Sono sound bars have it built into it. You know, cars are going to have this built into it. Um, they already do. It's it's just it's going to be everywhere before you know it. I love it. Well, a few more things too, before I stop sharing the screen, <laughs> Gold Diggers is really cool for those of you in LA, or if you're coming into town to visit, go check it out. Cause it's a really cool uh, experience. Um, Thanks, few, man. Few, yeah. I, I've loved it. You know, every time I've gone there, it's just, I even have a friend of mine who DJs there uh, and I'm like, man, I love, I love going there. The people there are great. And it's just a great overall, you know, experience. So I, anyone that's in LA, go check it out. It's a must. Yeah, we just had Dan Arbach from uh, from the Black Keys in here doing a tour here this morning. And he was like, you guys want to make one of these in Nashville? <laughs> and I was like, let's talk, buddy. You so, guys yeah. always. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys always have great, you know, artists in there, too. Even, you know, a few months ago, I went and had a meeting with you. And as I was walking out, uh, Rosalia was making tea and I was like, oh, hey, she's like, hi. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I got to tell you, man, like quick little story about her um i was absolutely blown away you know the one thing the one thing that i learned from even working with akon and sierra was that if somebody was successful it wasn't a mistake why they were successful you know i mean there can be a one hit wonder in this business and they're here one day and gone the next day or whatever but the truly successful people that I see work their asses off, you know, they're talented, but they're also very disciplined and, and it is a job for them. I mean, Rosalia came in here and took over our soundstage. She was the first one in every day. She ran every aspect of her, um, what they were doing here creatively. She was a taskmaster. She was incredibly disciplined. She knew what she wanted. She was the last one that walked out the door and her team was running to try and catch up with what she was doing. And it was, it was one of those inspirational things to me, you know, to see somebody like that, that, you know, is a beautiful, you know, because you get, you get this image of, of these people are, you know, puppets or whatever, you know, there's like, Oh, there's like, you know, the behind the scenes industry machine. plant. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, the hand up the butt, making them talk or whatever, but that's your you, PR. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like, man, it, it, it is not from my personal experience. It is not like that at all, man. It, it is the yeah. creative people that are really driving the business. And it makes it that much better too. When, you know, more times than not, there are some of the nicest people too to work with and, um, that always that, makes it great. <laughs> that's the other thing, man. They're yeah. always the sweetest, kindest, like have more time for you than anybody else will help you out. We'll pick up the phone, the first to respond. I mean, it's just, there's, there's a reason that those people are successful. Yeah. That's my experience. Well, thank you so much, Simon. This has been so great to to talk with you and, and all of your experiences in the music industry. And like I said, Gold Diggers is such a great, you know, it's, it's great. Every, like I said, it's, it's, it's really cool. You guys are doing something right there and and to be able to have, you know, the hotel, the, the sound stage and the studios, it, it all I'm sure is works together to become this great ecosystem there. So that's amazing. It's cool what you're doing. Yeah, man. The next time we got to do this face to face, I feel like it was kind of one-sided. I didn't get to really, you know, <laughs> talk about what you're doing and all of the stuff that we have in common and all that. So We'll have to continue this for sure. I really appreciate the opportunity, man. Absolutely. Yeah. The initial idea, I was, I was hoping to do it in person, but I, I, it was going to limit it to, I would have to have people be in LA or right. me go to them. Um, So I'm hoping that this first, you know, these first few months or a year, whatever it takes to have these, you know, these great conversations to expand, even having conversations with people in Europe or other States or whatever it may be. Uh, I, I thought that that route could allow me to, speak with more people but eventually i would love to you know it'd be great to have my own space and to just have people come in in person that's a dream <laughs> exactly. exactly come do it here man 
rare you humans time brother rare humans coming to gold diggers very soon you heard it here first yeah, man. <laughs> yeah we'll, 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 we'll do the live one and you know when this thing blows up man we'll do it live on the stage you know i would love to that'd be an honor to to be yeah. there in that space so the honor would be mine bro Simon, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Um, good luck with everything. And I can't wait. Maybe we'll, you know, we'll have to for sure do a, a part two. Uh, and yeah. and good luck with everything in 2023 too. Thanks, man. You too.